is CGTN, China Global Television Network. When Rex Tillerson began the first ever trip by a senior official of the Trump administration to Africa last week, security was high on his agenda. But by the time he abruptly ended the Five Nation tour, it was the security of his own job that made headlines. It came at a time when the U.S. has been trying to reset its relations with Africa. Meanwhile, China has also said it will deepen ties with the continent based on a win-win model. Tillerson cautioned Africa against being financially dependent on one country, but this was before he was fired by the U.S. president. So what happens now to the outcomes of the meetings Tillerson had in Africa? And where does this leave the state of U.S.-Africa relations under President Donald Trump? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, the first trip by a senior Trump official to Africa saw Rex Tillerson visiting Ethiopia, Kenya, Djibouti, Nigeria and Chad, signaling an effort by the United States to strengthen ties with security partners on the continent, as well as reset its relations with Africa to be based more on trade and less on aid. Let's take a look at some of the highlights of the tour. Security dominated the first U.S. diplomatic trip to Africa under the Trump administration. The now former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson kicked off what would become his last diplomatic trip in Ethiopia on the 7th of March. He met with both African Union Chair Musa Faki Mahamat as well as Haile Mariam Dessalin, who resigned as Prime Minister last month but is still acting in the post awaiting a replacement. At a news conference with his Ethiopian counterpart the next day, he said that the answer to political turmoil in Ethiopia was greater freedom for people. Well, we appreciate the government's responsibility to maintain control and not allow violence to break out and harm innocent people as well who may become victims of, of violence. Uh, it is important that, that, that the country move on past the state of emergency as quickly as possible. Tillerson then moved on to Djibouti, where he affirmed the United States' commitment to a broad partnership with the government of Djibouti, as it addresses regional political, development and security challenges. And discussions focused on much the same when he met President Uhuru Kenyatta in the Kenyan capital Nairobi on Friday. But it's on trade with Kenya that the United States has shown a renewed interest. We're eager to find more ways to work with you to grow our economic cooperation. In 2016, total trade between our countries was just under $1 billion. Mm. I know we can do much more. He then moved on to West Africa, where in Chad he commented on Washington's possible lifting of the travel ban on the country. Many, many important positive steps have been taken by the government of Chad to strengthen the control over its own passports, to strengthen information sharing around people who are of concern, potential terrorist, and these steps, I think, are going to allow us to take actions to begin to normalize relate the travel relationship with Chad. After meeting Chadian President Idris Deby, Tillerson concluded his trip in Nigeria. For the past nine years, the U.S. has backed Nigeria, Chad, and other countries in the Chad Basin in the battle against Boko Haram insurgents. What's important and has been, really been uh, powerful is the collaboration in the Joint Task Force uh, that, of which Nigeria is a part and Chad is a part, to, to respond to this threat of terrorism, of which Boko Haram is one organization. There are other threats that the leadership in this part of the country has to deal with, and this part of the, the continent has to deal with. So the United States is very engaged in that coordinated effort as well. Tillerson then mysteriously cut his trip short and returned to the United States on Monday under the guise of discussion around a possible meeting between the DPRK and the U.S. But only hours after he touched down in the United States, Trump announced on Twitter that Tillerson had been fired, leaving many of his African hosts questioning the effectiveness of the trip in the first place. Matthew Edwards, CGTN. Well, throughout his Africa trip, the outgoing U.S. Secretary of State found himself in the difficult position of explaining President Donald Trump's seemingly hazy policy on Africa.
and defending Trump's derogatory comments towards African countries. In Addis Ababa, CGTN's Girum Chala sought to find out if the U.S. president would be making a public apology to Africans over those comments. Uh, Mr. Tillerson, you've made a statement about China, saying that China encouraged dependency, utilized corrupt deals and endangered is uh, Africa's natural resource. Is it uh, something that you want to say again and what's the base of that? And uh, Mr. Chair, do you agree with the comments of Mr. Tillerson? Final question, President Donald Trump, uh, we've heard, has called Africa shithole and Africans. This is something that Africa is still digesting. Do you agree with that and do you believe Africa, I mean President Do Donald Trump owes Africans an apology. Thank you very much. I think the United States commitment to Africa is quite clear in terms of the importance we place on the relationship. Uh, the president himself uh, wrote a personal letter to the chairperson uh, reaffirming the importance of this relationship uh, from the standpoint of all aspects that I've I covered in answering a previous question. Uh, with respect to China's approach, as I've said to others around the world, we we are not in any way attempting to keep Chinese investment dollars out of Africa. They are badly needed. However, we think it's important that African countries carefully consider the terms of those investments. And we witness uh, the model that the Chinese follow. follow. Uh, they, they do not bring significant job creation locally. They don't bring significant training programs that enable African citizens to participate more fully in the future. And oftentimes the financing models are structured in a way that the country, when it gets into trouble financially, loses control of its own infrastructure or its own resources through default. Uh, so our message is for countries to consider carefully what the terms of those agreements are and not forfeit any elements of your sovereignty as you enter into such arrangements with China. We welcome Chinese participation, but we hope they will follow international rules, international norms, and respect the sovereignty of countries and respect the need to develop the citizens of those countries and create a future uh, for their own, for the people of those countries as well. I think the Africans are mature enough uh, to uh, engage uh, in uh, partnerships uh, of their own volition, which will be useful for uh, country, for the countries and the continent. So there is no monopoly. We have uh, multifaceted, multifarious uh, relations uh, with uh, parts of the world. We know where, uh, our interests and it is on all full awareness. I think that is most important. <laughs> Well, CGTN's Girum Chala also sat down with a Chinese ambassador to the African Union, Kuang Weilin. He spoke about Sino-African trade and called recent comments by the outgoing U.S. Secretary of State on China's investment on the continent disappointing. I, I think that uh, the statement is very um, disappointing. Um, I, I, I certainly uh, the statements are not true. I think, as I, I said earlier, that uh, uh, the, uh, there, is a, there is a proverb, a proverb in China. Only your feet can tell you whether your shoes fit you or not. I think the, uh, it is the, uh, the Africans uh, who can say whether this kind of relationship is beneficial to them or not. The fact that uh, China has remained uh, the biggest uh, trading partner for Africa uh, for the past uh, nine consecutive years tells you something, right? And I believe that uh, 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 more and more African countries are interested in uh, enhancing cooperation with China, in attracting more Chinese investments. So, uh, because they, they, they benefit, they have benefited a lot from this, uh, the relationship, because they think the Chinese investments have done good to their economy, to the, the, the to, to the people. That's why they are so uh, so interested and so eager to enhance uh, their relationship with China. And uh, so, uh, I think that uh, 
Africa is, it is the African that uh, the African countries that can that can tell whether this kind of relationship is good or not. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll have more insights into the state of U.S.-Africa relations under President Donald Trump. Stay with us. Every story starts out like this. Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible and why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sumitra Naidu. Hello, Nairobi. Well, of course, this is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. Welcome back to Talk Africa. And now to offer further insights into the state of U.S.-Africa relations under U.S. President Donald Trump. I have expert guests standing by in Philadelphia, Michael Jones, former White House speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush and Africa policy expert at the Heritage Foundation. And with me in Nairobi, Professor Peter Kagwanja. He's the president and CEO of the Africa Policy Institute. You all gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the program. Uh, Professor, let me start off with you because you were monitoring this from um, uh, Africa here. And outgoing U.S. Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson was in Africa, the, the highest profile mm. U.S. diplomat to visit Africa in the last uh, one year. First, give us your impression and your observation of that visit. Well, I followed um, uh, Tillerson's visit to Africa keenly because it came uh, against the backdrop of another visit early this year by the Chinese uh, foreign minister. And for me as an African analyst, my main observation was to see how this is going to play out. What is America going to offer uh, given what China offered? And uh, I, I think uh, I wouldn't hesitate to say that uh, America came before, below par, not in terms of anything, but because instead of giving Africa an offer, you started threatening Africa, warning Africa. And we wanted to see what you are bringing onto the table. Oh, Africa is going to be indebted. Uh, Africa is going to be saddled with the lifetime uh, shackles of a bed or that. Uh, so anyway, we, we found that was not very good. Tillerson himself performed extremely well, extremely well. Right. I, and, I, and, I, and when I mean well, it's because uh, he warmed up to Africans and Africans warmed up to him. And we thought this was a golden opportunity to rebuild Africa-U.S. Uh, relations. Let me get Michael Johnson's uh, response to that, though. D did the U.S. come uh, below par in that visit by outgoing U.S. Secretary of State? No, I think he had a really exceptional visit to a number of uh, countries. Obviously, it's very difficult whenever you send a high-level U.S. official there because, you know, you've got 46 sub-Saharan African countries. You can't get to all of them. But I think he really covered a great degree of ground. I think he made it clear that Africa continues to matter to the United States on a humanitarian basis, um, on a strategic basis, and maybe most promising on a trade and economic development basis. Uh, and I think he also kind of indicated, which I think is increasingly recognized, that the U.S. is not wedded to its historical approaches to uh, U.S. policy in the region. Taking a fresh look at it is absolutely warranted. We've done some great things in Africa. I mean, I, uh, as far as humanitarian assistance in the crises of, you know, from Ethiopia to southern Sudan to West Africa right. to the, you know, Rwanda situation, the U.S. has been there all the time. However, I think in fairness, and we're always kind of reevaluating things to be intellectually honest about it, a lot of our foreign aid programs have not really uh, obtained the objectives they were intended to. There continues to be a lot of corruption throughout Africa, and foreign aid itself is often victimized by that. 
And, you know, I think we really uh, have an opportunity under this new president and now a new secretary of state to uh, come up with a creative re-engagement of Africa. And Are we going to look at that re creative re-engagement? And I know, uh, pro uh, Professor, I know you, you did have some sentiments to respond to uh, from Michael Jones. You, you do not agree that uh, the visit went... No, well. no I, I, am, I, I am puzzled by the redundancy and outdatedness of the American policy towards Africa, which is essentially based on humanitarian uh, considerations. We are not a humanitarian case. We have moved from humanitarian to development. So when in the 21st century, uh, Trump's administration still come to hamper on these uh, you know, humanitarian assistance, corruption and all, it is still the, past, the old image of Africa in uh, American foreign policy that Africans are children, uh, grown up children who need to be looked after. They need to be taught morals about how not to be corrupt. And, and this angel -like, uh, attitude of the America is not helpful because they are themselves in a crisis. Right, Michael Jones, and, and, your response? And, and therefore, this uh, issue about all oh, this uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, this human we don't want humanitarian assistance. We want development to look after ourselves. That is the difference between America and China. China is not talking about humanitarian. China is not talking about corruption and helping Africa. We'll deal with ourselves. We are not babies. Right, uh, Michael Jones, your thoughts? Yeah, I think obviously, you know, if we announced that we were going to terminate humanitarian assistance to Africa, there would be great opposition to it throughout the OAU, great opposition throughout the continent. I do appreciate that perspective, and it's one that actually, throughout my career and my own visits in Africa, I've echoed myself, that often our humanitarian aid has, you know, periodically been counterproductive. But also on the larger crises, I mean, we have been a life-saving body that I think for the most part it continues to be valued in disease prevention, infectious diseases, uh, um, disasters, uh, obviously mass famine. So those, but I do agree with you that this might be a rearview mirror of policy uh, toward the continent. And I do think that it's important that we view Africa as a peer, they're not a child, and it's important also that Africa and the individual uh, uh, dozens of countries that comprise Sub-Saharan let, let Africa come really in here. get their arms around these crises themselves. Let me just come so in that's, here. So that's uh, not, an, it's not an unreasonable point that our... Let me just come in here, uh, Michael, because um, I know Professor does want to respond to that. And moving away from just uh, humanitarian assistance as well, uh, Tillerson did talk about trade and security issues as part of the agenda for the United States. That is what we wanted to hear more from the United States. And uh, in last visit by President Obama, he was very clear about what uh, area he America want to focus on, uh, you know, uh, technology, particular IT technology, uh, you know, close the link between Africa and, and Washington. And he was very clear and uh, you know, targeted. Uh, reading the website of the State Department before the departure of Tillerson, there were very clear indications of the things that he want to engage on Africa. But the moment he hit the ground, he started talking about, you know, the Chinese debt. We don't know where China came in. What about the debt we owe to Japan? What about the debt we owe to, to UK? What about the, the European Union? Africa is in a development mode and it's borrowing money. We are floating uh, boards you know, investment boards in European capitals so that we can raise our lives be beyond the basket case and this humanitarian intervention. So what we want to tell, uh, you know, uh, Michael and others is that uh, please treat us not as a basket humanitarian case. We need development. We need to talk development. That's the discussion we want. Think tanks in Washington are concentrating on Africa, the old image of Africa as disease-ridden, humanitarian case, right. basket case. We want to have a positive view about Africa. Right. Uh, Michael Jones, uh, uh, this is similarly uh, obsession, obsession by uh, Washington with uh, China's uh, footprint on the continent. Why is the U.S. concerned about that? Well, I think because we're starting to articulate in a much more open way, which hopefully is going to end in a constructive uh, resolution, a lot of broad concerns that we have with our relationship in China. Now, you have two very different levels of engagement between what we're doing in Africa and what China's doing. I mean, we have really tried to promote market economies. 
in Africa. I think it's our view and it's uh, the view of many governments that we've worked with that that is the ultimate solution to allowing Africans to be empowered, to acquire property, to, uh, be, you know, to hire employees, to be able to uh, you know, invest in, in, in businesses and potentially sell them or to have private equity involved. I think the China approach, uh, which I'm not criticizing, but it's a more centralized approach. It's a more government to government approach. Um, there hasn't been the history of engagement in uh, support for, you know, some of these reformation efforts right. that I think ultimately lay the foundation on which Africa's development lies. I mean, so if the foundation is not solid, Let, I think the concern that, uh, uh, that Tillerson raised is about the way that China is going about it and the debt that's being imposed on Africa, uh, you know, as part of this. And there would be different ways to potentially finance this from uh, China's is, is that justified, though, that'll Professor part of a broad I mean, you're, you're, you're hearing the views from us. Michael Jones. Is there any basis for that justification? Let, let me say this: that um, as an African, I'm not bothered about what the U.S. interests are. I'm not bothered about what the Chinese interests are in Africa. I'm bothered about the added value each of the investor or African partner is bringing onto the table. What worries me about uh, America's foreign policy under Trump is that it is obsessed with China and we are the people who are inviting the Chinese. I was in the uh, previous Kenyan administration and went to Washington uh, and New York and uh, asked the, offic of the officials and investors to come and invest in a railway. They said no. They thought us to refurbish, to refurbish our old railway. We went to Beijing. They said yes. And now we have a railway. We can move from Nairobi to Mombasa in less than six hours. Our railway is booked up to April. Now our, 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 our cargo is moving from, will be moving from Mombasa to, right. to Kisumu in a cheaper cost. This is the kind of debate, this is the debate we want to hear about what is America going to base its engagement with Africa on. Not lecture about how we should behave with China or how China should behave with us. Let Let's be patronizing. We want to hear when the Secretary of State, the next one, comes to Africa, let him tell us this is what America is bringing onto the table, not telling us how we should behave. Let, let, let me put that, though, to Michael Jones. Uh, moving forward, though, Michael, what is American interest going to be on the continent? Before cle because uh, clearly, over the last one year, America has not really made Africa a priority. So moving forward, what will those interests be? I think you would look at it almost categorically. I mean, we have a strategic interest of two terrorists, at least two prominent terrorist movements that, you know, a decade into the war against uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, they continue to exist. That's concerning. I, I don't know what's taken a decade, frankly, for us to be able to clear that situation up, but it should be. And we need to, I think Somalia is doing some interesting and encouraging things with their amnesty program and some other initiatives. We need to fix that. Uh, clearly, the issue with uh, Boko uh, Haram continues to be a concern. I want to be engaged with that. That's sort of the strategic side. We have a military presence in Djibouti that strategically is, remains to be very important for U.S. Uh, interests uh, globally. We have trade interests and, uh, you, you know, that I think in fairness, you know, when we talk about like asking to invest in Africa, well, that's not the way investment works. You don't ask for investment. You know, the, if the, if from, a, from a market standpoint, Africa has to continue, as I believe it is doing, move in a direction that it becomes an appealing market that investors want to move in there, move in, move in there because they have uh, products and opportunities and trade relationships that are mutually beneficial to uh, the U.S. and, and uh, respective African countries. And then I continue to believe, you know, we remain engaged and I think we need to listen to Africa, and I'm listening to, to what both of you are saying. I'm intrigued by the criticism you right. have of U.S. humanitarian assistance in the continent. I think we want to, I think that's a fair point. And, you know, we want to, I think, you know, sort of hear more from, not African heads of state as much, but more from the African people about how is this all going? I mean, we've right. spent billions of dollars now in Africa since the end of colonialism. Right, Con Professor. And we continue to have autocratic governments, continue to have economies that are not market oriented. What can we do a better job of? And I, I'd I think we really want to do a little more listening there than preaching.
Right, and, uh, uh, Professor, look forward to some creative, maybe uh, new approaches. There's an incoming Secretary of State, and of course, uh, Rex Tillerson had already uh, sort of like set a blueprint for uh, some engagement with the continent uh, with his visit. Though, is it realistic now, though, to say that uh, there is going to be a change or there's going to be a more enhanced U.S. Africa policy with an incoming Secretary of State? Mm, uh, we we expect the incoming uh, Secretary of State to basically work on some of the, the issues that were agreed upon. Le, uh, to, on a very positive note, one cannot forget that our America is investing a lot. I'm, I mean, the American citizen and the American taxpayer uh, for security in Africa, Somalia, South Sudan, and elsewhere. And, and we cannot overlook that. And therefore, the incoming Secretary of State must continue to deepen engagement with Africa in regard to creating an enabling environment for investments and development. But in terms of development, trade, uh, and the system, I, I think Americans need to have a more nuanced engagement with Africa. It has to, re to revisit its own uh, pillars, uh, the, its own precepts about what Africa is and what Africa is not. And I think, I think that's where China has done better than America. And that's what Clinton, I mean, um, Obama realized when he called the Africa Summit. Maybe America need to call another America, I mean, Trump need to call another Africa-America summit to basically uh, uh, examine the foundations of our relationship. Because as they are now uh, listening to Michael and, and right. others, they are very patronizing. They assume that my generation, who are educated in Chicago, who have, uh, you know, uh, in Africa, we, we, uh, my generation doesn't uh, buy that nonsense that, uh, that Africa should be a humanitarian case. I want to get the view yeah. from Michael Jones. You have the final word uh, on this and very briefly, your winding up comments. Well, for uh, you know, several decades now since the end of colonialism, Africa has had you know, the engagement of Europe, which is, I think, being widely criticized. There is broad concern throughout Africa, and obviously you're hearing some support also for what China is doing. China's a, you know, I think taking a fresh and much longer term view of the African continent, frankly, than, than even we have. I mean, I, I would give them almost some credit for that. I think they're uh, long term thinkers and there's a lot of value in that. Um, and the U.S., uh, you know, criticize it, if you will. I, I, you're right. It's been a, you know, we have our primary engagement in the continent has been designed to help Africans that have been facing some very dire circumstances. We, the perception broadly in American foreign policy circles is that we do have strategic interests in Africa. They're important, but they haven't ranked at the top of strategic priorities of the world. And so I think right now, really in the trade and, and development areas, um, the, the biggest opportunity exists for the United States to work in really trying to uh, foster Because Africa is going to be, a, is already a huge marketplace. Right for trade, it could ultimately be the largest, one of the largest in the world. And I would like to see, hopefully, the United States and China, if this can be done, talk broadly about what's in the best interests of Africa and to work collaboratively as opposed to working in conflict. Right. Uh, I think the potential for that exists. I know the aspiration for it exists. It's obviously more difficult done than said, but I do feel that that would be very important if it could be accomplished. Michael Jones, we're going to leave it there for the moment, but thank you all very much for being on the uh, program. That's all we have time for this week. Thank you to my guests for their insights in Philadelphia. Michael Jones, former White House speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush and Africa policy expert at the Heritage Foundation. And with me in Nairobi, Professor Peter Kagwanja, President and CEO of the Africa Policy Institute. To you all, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us on Talk Africa. Remember, you can join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube and join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall, it's goodbye.